Hello everyone and welcome to the Protecting the Village show. Brought to you by the Protecting the Village campaign, presented by T Coast Communications and Marketing and funded by Allegheny Franciscan Ministries. I'm your host Anthony Maynard and today we have with us Dr. Donna Mills. Dr. Mills is a member of the school board. She is also part of the leadership at Save Our Children here in Fort Pierce, Florida. And we are glad to have her on. Dr. Mills, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Thank you for joining us. Let's get right into it. Um, I wanted to start off with you talking about your origins because different from your husband, uh, Pastor Kenny, you uh, weren't born here in Fort Pierce um, and had to make your way here to Florida somehow. So if you wanna share a little bit with the viewing audience about your background, where you come from, and how you got here to Fort Pierce. Well, I was born in New Jersey, uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, and grew up in that area. Um, in, in fact, I, I lived in Newark for a while. I lived in Hoboken for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in East Orange for a while. Elizabeth for a while. All of those are different cities. You know Jersey. Yeah, okay. I had to travel a little bit. So um, that is where I originate from, born and raised in Jersey, in New Jersey. Um, most of my family is either in New Jersey or Baltimore. I do not have um, much family here, except for those that basically followed me and their children are here now and they you know or they're here and growing up in this area so we're really all northerners I see mm -hmm. okay so that's where you started how did you how did you get here what 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 brought you here to Fort Pierce well I married this wonderful man named Pastor Kenny Mills we know him by that especially the okay. Lincoln Park area um, that is where he grew up and that's his home area uh, and he is absolutely in love with Fort Pierce and that area. Mm -hmm. um, but he met me uh, many years ago. We have now been uh, married for 38 years. Wow, and congratulations. And a long time. And so quickly after marriage, uh, we, we moved, well, a couple of years after marrying, he moved me back to his hometown. Okay. And that is how uh, we ended up back here. Uh, I remember the, the day and the time. It was winter. It was, uh, we were snowed in. It had been a winter storm. And our, our, uh, our truck, which was a U-Haul truck, had um, just the cab, the front cab seat. There was no back. So all of us, the two of us and our three kids, all crammed up into the front <laughs> cab of that. And every inch of that truck was filled with our belongings, every single inch. And then in the back, we had our little Volkswagen hooked up with our dog in the Volkswagen. <laughs> so that is how we came back here. And I really believe it was God's leading that we, that we came back here because my husband had been saying how he wanted to move back to his hometown. And I was saying, no, 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 because every time I would come here, um, I, my, my, I would get a hay fever flare up, my sinuses and oh, yeah. everything just, you know, the pollen in the air and it just, I'd be really sick. And so I'm like, why would I move to a place, <laughs> you know, that would cause me so much illness? Right, you know? right. Purposely, and, right. Right, yeah. purposely. That was like insane to me. And then when I would get back, we get back up north, I'd be fine again. So there was something different in the atmosphere. But um, I, I, at the same time, we were, we were newly Christian people. We loved the Lord, born again, I want to say, because we really got saved, uh, for those who can understand what that means. And uh, it, I wanted to do God's will. I wanted his will to be done in my life. And so saying I'm not moving back somewhere and it being God's will does not mm -hmm. fit. Right. So what the Lord did in his great wisdom was he allowed me to get start getting sick with my sinuses up north. Mm. It just like just flared up and I became just as bad there that I was here. <laughs> and so then I said to the Lord, 
Lord, I'll go. <laughs> if I'm going to be sick in both places, Lord, I'll just go. Right, right as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, at that time, I don't remember there being any medica- medicine that I knew of to control it. Yeah. But here's the, the miracle working power of God. You know, I'm also a minister. I'm, I'm madly in love with the Lord. I'm a servant of the Most High God, okay? I, I wear a lot of hats. Mm-hmm. But uh, that is one of my main hats is to serve him first. Right. You know? So we get back as we're getting closer and closer to Florida. All of a sudden, I start feeling the healing process. And by the mm-hmm. time we got to Fort Pierce, Florida, which we moved back, we moved into the house that my husband was raised in, okay? His siblings, uh, which is 12 of them, 12, 11 siblings, you know, all together. They were all raised in that house. The house actually, by this time, it was one of them houses that set on four pillars, right. or so many pillars, not mm-hmm. four, <laughs> so many pillars. And in the back of the house, the pillars had sunk. So here I come from up north, you know, yeah. used to a certain type of life, and I come into this house that's leaning, <laughs> you know. It was a real challenge, mm-hmm. and no air condition, you know, in the home. We had, we had, we had a window. We bought a window air conditioner right. for one of the rooms, or two of the rooms. But um, long story short, when I got back, I was healed, completely healed. And I stayed healed from in this area, no sinus problems whatsoever for many years. And then it came back. So now I'm faithfully on my pills every day to keep myself, you know, pulled together here. Thank God for medicine. Well, praise God that, you know, he, he, he kept you until he released Zyrtec. There you go. Yeah, and, then, yeah, right. and now you all exactly. set, right? <laughs> So in that now, you come back with your husband and family and Pastor Kenny had shared with us in his interview that started Bible Way which became Save Our Children and talk a little bit about what your role was in that in terms of Bible Way and Save Our Children and bringing that concept to where it is now. We were co-pastors. We started out in the church that his his mother um, uh, grew her children up in and we attended that church but we were hearing a calling from God that was saying, go ye out into the community. Mm. And so we started with a street service. Um, and we would go right on the street corner and we preach that gospel and then feed people. Okay. So we actually took our, our own tithes to feed people. And as others heard about what we were doing, they joined in and also made donations. Okay. So we were able to feed hundreds of families and people on the street corners and we were very faithful with that for many years we also opened up a um a clothing ministry where people can come in and get clothes for themselves or for their family members and uh and so yeah we uh, we were co-pastors and we started the bible way soul saving station but we also saw that there were other needs the children needed um you know I don't know how many of you out there know God, but I have to tell you that when you walk with him, it is really truly an adventure. Mm -hmm. If you are obedient to what you believe you've been called in, there's no telling where he will take you and what he will do with your life. Because um, we, you know, I'm thinking about a dream that I had, and I know we don't have much time, but in this dream, I saw the children and that they needed the love and they needed the attention. And so I looked at my own life. My life was a struggle. My family went through many hardships. And so I wanted to make sure that we were able to bring um, deliverance Mm. to some of the children that were living in dire situations. We would have our street services on Avenue D Many people strung out on drugs, yeah. strung out on alcohol, which is a drug, you know, right. and um, really addicted and in, in bad shape. And they had children. Right. And we wanted to bring to those children some life and some hope, you know, and, and they just began to pile into the ministry. And before we knew it, we were working with children. Okay. Now, I think it's fitting 
<laughs> that you were working with children because part of your journey in life um, from that moving forward more sort towards present day, um, you are an elected school board member, mm -hmm. the first African-American female elected to the school board. Um, congratulations on that. Thank I know you've you served more than one term as a school board member. 11 years now. And, and have risen in terms of prominence and position as it relates to the school board. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that experience for the audience in terms of what led you to becoming uh, or wanting to become a member of the school board and what that process was like? Well, Mr. Maynard and I became very interested in um, the children educationally, yeah. academically, starting at Bible Way yeah. um, and Save Our Children. And so we began to do a lot of teaching the children about their history. Mm -hmm. Our children were African Americans and Haitians. And we began to teach them about their history and bring positive affirmations to them. Right. You know, when I first got here and we first started with these children, they would come in calling each other the N-word. And being up north, we didn't use that word. We didn't flip that word around like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like really, um, to my ears, it was like poison. Mm -hmm. And so we had to teach them self-esteem and understanding who they were. They were not the N-word. And, and so we did not want to hear them calling each other and by the N-word. And by the time we finished working with children, um, not just academically, but emotionally, socially, you know, right. the whole gamut. Because I believe true education, you educate the whole being. Well you know? um, so when we started that, um, it took us to really Academically, we started a couple of schools. We started two preschools, and we also started a K to eight school at one time. And these were children for children who were failing out of the school system. Mm -hmm. And that's how we advertise. If your child is not being successful within the regular public school system, if they are not making it, we're here to help that child. Right. And so that we began to work with children. That, and it's phenomenal what children can do when you get their attention. If you don't get their attention, you, you, you just can't teach them anything. But once you get their attention and they know that you care and you love them, sometimes tough love, nevertheless is love, and you get their attention, you can teach a child anything. So with that background, when an opportunity or you saw the need in terms of becoming a school board member, was there any fear or apprehension about going through the process of becoming an elected member? Yes, it was. Okay. <laughs> and yes, and where, where did that come from? Why was that there? Well, because for one thing, they, 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 they had never been, there had only been one African American on the school board mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the history of St. Lucie County. And he was placed on that school board um, not electively at first, because I, I, can, I don't know the, the, the real, uh, the whole history, so I won't say anything I'm not sure of. But after, it took a while, it was like he was, he was appointed. Hmm. And then um, after a while, he did have to run for re-election. But he ended up on the school board for over 30 something years. In fact, uh, he's one, if not the longest African American to serve on the school board in the state of Florida. Wow. If he's not the, he's the second or the third, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but there had never been a black female on the school board. So that was one challenge right there. But my main reason for running, I went to a meeting with a group of um, African American men, black men. In fact, I was the only female in this meeting. And we went to the school board with the superintendent of that time. We met, met with the superintendent and one of the board members. And we went there to say how important it is that our children are taught African American history. And you know, there is a state law that says that we must, all schools in the state of Florida, must merge African American history with core classes. So the sciences, the maths, all of the main subjects, mm -hmm. not just history, right. All main subjects, we must merge 
African American history in those subjects. And even build some of our curriculum around uh, famous mathematicians and famous scientists and you know inventors and these things. And so we went there because it was not being implemented at that time. Right. So we were saying, our kids need that for their own self-esteem. Mm. You know, um, our other kids, and I say our kids because all kids are ours, our other children of the white race was getting that because everything was built around the white race in school. And that is why the law came out, so that it could be shared. Here in St. Lucie County, we have an even amount percentage of children between white, black, and Hispanic. There is 34% white, 33% black, 33% Hispanic. Therefore, we need to make sure that our education is focusing on all of those areas for all of our children. Well, when we was in the meeting, we were basically told, said to us, said to us, well, we thought you wanted your children to get a better education. And when that statement was made, I knew and I don't think it was made in a way to be harmful. It was made in a way that they did not understand. They did not realize that we could raise the academic achievement level by making sure that their history was brought into the classroom to build their self-esteem and to help our students understand that they could become anything and anyone despite whatever they might, in spite of, whatever they might have to endure, because these great people that are history, and it's been hidden history, but these great people that have made history uh, will, will help them understand it in a hard time, will help our children, and not just our children, but all of our children, not just African American children. Right. White children need to understand this as well because there's a lot of stereotyping that goes on because they don't know the history of the African American. Right. So once they get it, they, oh wow, these people did this, that, and the other, it helps everybody. It helps with those that have been uh, taught to stereotype people and it helps with those who do not know where they come from. So long story short, that's why I ran for school board. That is what made that decision for me to run. When I finished with the meeting, I set, got back in my car, I sat there, and I wept before the Lord. And I said, Lord, we need someone on that school board that understands the plight of our people. And what I heard in my spirit is, why not you? Mm. I've given you the education, I've given you the training, you, you know, you've been through it, training and educated. Why not you? Well, that scared me to death. <laughs> but I said, yes, Lord. And so I have to give him the credit, all the credit. Next thing I knew, went to my family, told them I was running. They're looking at me like I'm crazy. I haven't even talked this thing over with them, you know. But I'm running. And they got behind me and backed me. And... Uh, when I joined the school board, there was five other people that were already running when I joined the campaign. There were six of us that year because one of the school board members was retiring, so the seat was open. I didn't even know that. I just went down to the, to the um, uh, voting election place and Gertrude and them and went down there and started asking questions. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, my district was wide open and there was five people and I only had two weeks to get that $2,000 together to give to them in order to qualify. Right. Well, one thing led to not, I didn't have $2,000. You know, we were poor people, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> we didn't have the 2000 at that time. We did not have the $2,000. But I called three people up who had money, who we had, been a, we had made a difference in their lives. And they just like that, hey, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. In, in one, two days, I had the $2,000, and I was able to go down there. And so I won out of six people running that right. year in 2010. And I know it's a, it's a countywide election. So everybody, you got to get everybody's vote. Right. 
And uh, not just the Lincoln Park or not just the, everybody's vote you have to get. So, and a, a huge amount of people, white, black, Hispanic, and everybody in between, voted for me to become the first black school board member. So I'm on my third term now, and it's been 11 years. I come up to run again in 2022. And so I've been asked several times this year, are you gonna run again? Yes, I'm gonna run again. <laughs> our children need me, as far as I'm concerned. All of our children of St. Lucie County need me to serve on that school board. And not just our children, but our teachers, and everybody that works for our district. As far as I'm concerned, I am needed, and as long as I feel needed and the people understand that I should be there, I will be there. Of course, God, if God called me to do something else, it's a whole different story, but outside of that, I'll be there. Well, I, I, and, we, and we appreciate you being there. Um, one of the points that you brought out there, and, 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 and then towards the end in terms of God calling you and what you're doing there. now. What I heard you basically say was there was fear there, but when he said, why not you, rather than sacrifice your time, effort, and abilities to try to find someone or um, have someone else, convince someone else to move forward to fill that position, you were obedient in taking that, that risk and putting yourself out there yourself. You know, the word tells us that obedience is, in fact, better than sacrifice. So we thank you for that. We thank you for being obedient um, to the Lord and getting into the position that you're in now and all of the help that you provided uh, on the school board with the children, or with the education. I mean, the points that you made there are spectacular in terms of what it does for self-esteem and all of those other things. So, you know, a lot of the young children now owe some of that to that they've encountered to you and may not even recognize that. So we want to thank you for that. Uh, a number of the things that you captured in there, I want you to focus a little bit on, I, I'm also hearing you have a certain upbringing in New Jersey. Uh, and that's where you live, that's where you came up, in the North and so forth. Now, your husband is like, hey, we need to move back to Florida. You come back into the Southern environment and you have really been obedient to the Lord and stepped out there and interacted, acclimated yourself with the community. Um, you're on your third turn, going to your fourth. And it would almost seem like that's a pretty easy thing to come from the north to the south, acclimate, become a part of the community. Um, I myself uh, am a northern transplant. And you know, I would offer that it's not as seamless as you just made it seem in what you described. Can you, can you share a little bit about that as well? Yes, um, and hopefully we have a little bit of time to talk about since COVID because um, I can share some stuff that's going on sure. here um, and what we're doing to help uh, the community in that way. Uh, but coming here um, was challenge enough because I've already spoken of that mm -hmm. particular challenge. But also, the environment was different, and still is. Being a northerner and coming from the north to the south um, was pretty challenging in the way of seeing how many people still think here in the south. Uh, the first time I was called the N-word, I'm walking down the street with my babies on 25th Street, we're going back some years now. Mm -hmm. A truck comes past us full of young white guys, and they call me a black N, you know, and they're laughing. I got my babies with me, you know? They're old enough to understand what just happened. Mm -hmm. That was very trying for me. Um, the other, I say I kind of went into a little culture shock, yeah. You know, now, I did mission work in Haiti for 25 years. I went into serious culture shock there. But here, when I moved from the north to the south, I went through a, a form of culture shock. Uh, the other thing that really shocked me was how I kept people of color, of my color, black people, would stare at me. And they wouldn't smile and they wouldn't speak. <laughs> and up north, you don't stare at each other. I mean, that's like you stare at somebody else. They're going to ask you, what in the mm, you staring at? Mm -hmm. 
right? But I had to go to my husband with this because I would be being stared at wherever I was going in Fort Pierce by black people. And it would be different if it was a smile and, you know, shake yeah. your head, mm -hmm. you know, good morning, how you doing? But I didn't get that. So I couldn't understand that, and I went to my husband and shared with him what was going on. He said, you know what it is? He said, everybody knows everybody. And when a new face comes in, they're wondering what family you're connected with, you know, who are you, where did you come from? Right. Then, you know, because when they know, when they know their faces, you know, they greet each other and they smile and they social, you know, and they, they conversate. But if they don't know you, they're trying to figure out where you come from. You know, like you're a Martian from somewhere else. Right. <laughs> That's the way I was being looked at. Right. So um, that was a challenge. So here I'm challenged by both white and blacks being a northerner. And, um, you know, I have definitely, I've been around so long now, I say, because it's been almost 40 years that I've been in this community that I really do feel I am a part of the community. I, this is my home now. You know, this is home to me. And I, I want people to accept me like they accept one another. Because this is home. They're like my sisters and brothers here in the North. Like they are, and I'm doing everything I can to make a difference. That's the only reason why I do what I do to make a difference, to help someone else. So, but I have had my challenges without going into stories that somebody might see and know it was them, <laughs> but it was not, they did not make it easy for me to be here. You know, um, I have definitely dealt with jealousy and not from just um, other blacks, but whites, you know, and when you're trying to achieve here, what I found up north, people are really, really not interested, that interested in, you know, whether you, you know, it's like everybody, if you can, if you can do it, achieve. Right. You know, it's no, it's no, I didn't experience no second thoughts in that way. But here I have, so, yeah. Yeah, well said. Um, I think you, you captured a number of things there. Um, you know, I'm a northern transplant myself, if I really think about it. Ticos Marketing and Communications is essentially a transplant uh, entity, if you will. Um, uh, had not been for our efforts, we wouldn't be um, doing this interview. We wouldn't be embraced in the, in the Protecting the Village campaign. Um, but it's important to note that that campaign and what we do is a mixture of you know, northern transplants and those native to Fort yeah, Pierce. All of us doing it together. Right, and the, so teamwork makes the dream work. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the putting all of those things to the side and working towards the common goal mm -hmm. that's allowed us to bring this to Lincoln Park. And I'm glad that we've been able to get past some of that past or previous thinking and work together. That being said, you touched on one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is the entire COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. the vaccinations and so forth, as that relates to you and the, the school board and the children in this county. Can you touch on that a little bit? Okay, well, I'll first touch on Save Our Children, what we're doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband mentioned earlier in his um, time of speaking how we've had to change everything okay. right now, dealing with COVID. And so at Save Our Children, what we've done, we're really working on the social, emotional, uh, educational part of the child. Mm -hmm. And I say social and emotional, we do it through virtual. Right. Uh, so we have what we call family fun night once a week where children can come on and we just have fun. Mm -hmm. We just let them in, talk to each other, and we just bring out the best of them. You know, they become great conversationalists and, you know, just by giving them that time enough awesome. time, and, and especially those that come on consistently. So we do that, but we are also uh, have started a one-on-one -on -one tutorial program where we match a child up with an adult, virtually. Mm -hmm. And they, once a week, will meet that child on our, on our Zoom meeting, and we put them into their own um, rooms. And so they go in that room with that child, and they help them in either math or reading. Nice. or language arts or something to that effect. And so that is what we're doing. Um, and so we're recruiting volunteers. 
Um, I just talked with the teachers union and asked them to, you know, uh, make mention of it to their um, retired okay. teachers and so forth. And everywhere I go, I mention it. And as a result, we have gotten a group of strong volunteers and we continue to recruit because we need more. Uh, and, and then we, we have our children and we've opened it to all the children of St. Lucie County. So you don't have to be poor to have be a part of the tutorial program. Right. You just need to, your child needs to have made a D or an F in the last quarter. So we're expecting the report cards and we're excited about it because we have had a chance to work with a few of the children at least for a solid month that in the second quarter had either D or F. And that's what we, that's it. We don't charge anything for it. You know, we even have waived our registration fee so that we can make this possible for our community children. As a school board member, very excited to uh, make the announcement for those who may not know. Uh, all of our teachers that are age 50 and older can now get an immunization shot and get the vaccine. So that has taken some more out of time because it was 65 right. or older. Now it's 50 regardless. You don't have to have an underlying condition or anything. If you're 50 um, plus, you can get an uh, immunization shot. And we're doing that because our teachers are our frontline people right. in the classroom. And we want the kids to go back to brick and mortar, but that's we cannot put our teachers in danger. Right. And so to make our teachers even comfortable with going back, they need to have that immunization so that they can feel comfortable enough where their emotions are not all out of whack. Because if a teacher, I say like they say, if mama's not happy, nobody is in the household. Well, can you imagine that classroom? We've got to make sure our teachers are happy. So I'm a strong advocate for our educators that we can keep them happy so that their children in their classroom would also be happy. Awesome. Well, thank you. I mean, you do so much. I, I almost, I, 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 I would be remiss if I don't end asking this question, even given all that you laid out that you do, but what is the future for Dr. Donna Mills? We know that you're going to be running again in the school board. Are there any other initiatives that are going on either with Save Our Children or with the school board or you personally that we can expect to see from you in the future? Well, right now, um, with Save Our Children, you can expect for me to run this tutorial program uh, because it does have to take someone that can organize and can relate to people and can keep things together and grow and move forward. Right. Because we don't know when COVID will be at a place where we can really have our children come back with no concerns mm -hmm. in, in regards to the school or to our afternoon programs. So we want this thing to grow and, and possibly even after COVID continue what we're doing now because me and Pastor, we're getting older and we have to, we still want to work with children. We still want to work with our community, but we have to do it in a wise way that we're able to do so. So we want to make that program strong. As a school board member, my, my, my desire is to build upon what we already have. We've made some great accomplishments but we still have our gap is too wide still. When I say our gap, we have uh, those percentages that I gave you. The African-American child is doing the, um, is doing the worst when it comes to the academics. They've come, we've come a long ways, uh, Mr. Maynard, mm -hmm. in, in their performance, but I know they can be right there with the other two groups. Our black males especially have, have really fallen behind. They've come up. And it takes a while, it's a process. But I know that we can have them side by side with their white, white counterparts and their Hispanic counterparts. So my goal is to continue to push toward whatever we need to do to make that happen. Currently we are graduating, when I came, first came on, first of all, we were graduating our kids in this low 60 percentile mm. graduation rates. Today we're in the 90 percentile awesome. for graduation. So there's been a huge improvement in our school district. And we are um, just a couple of points away from an A district. We were a low C district when I came on. So we've come real far, but, but I am making sure, my goal is to make sure that our black children 
and especially our black males, even lower than their counterparts, mm. that is not acceptable to me. And I will continue to fight that fight until everyone is treated equal and everyone gets equal access. And, and, and that is my, my desire. Okay. Well, we thank you very much for sharing that with us. We thank you for your openness and your candor in this interview about your life and what's brought you here and all that you're doing. Uh, we thank you for your work in the community, your work in the schools, and for you being who you are in this community. The Protecting the Village campaign would not be able to do all of the things that it has been able to do and be able to progress and move forward without you, Dr. Mills, and your husband, Pastor Kenny. Um, we thank you again both for all of the work that you've put in. I um, look forward to whatever uh, you put on the table in the future um, because we know it'll be a benefit to the community. This has been the Protecting the Village show, and we'll see you again next time.